Hi. Um, I don't like to be told that I can't do something, but more specifically, I don't like to be told that I can't do something because I'm a girl. And I think that one of the biggest problems that we have with the media today in American society is that oftentimes it sends us that message. And I'm not just talking about sexist depictions of women in TV shows or movies or music videos. I'm talking about in the broadcast media, there's a certain sexualization of women that I'm not too comfortable with. I remember once when I was a little girl watching the evening news with my mom, I remember having one conversation that sort of stuck with me. I noticed something that confused me. I noticed that all of the women that I noticed, either behind anchoring desks or out being correspondents, they looked very, very beautiful, young, made up, and glamorous, which is fine, but the men didn't. They looked older, and basically, like, they weren't caring about their looks. They had more important things to focus on. They had to get the story down, analyze the facts, and that is what all of their jobs are. So I didn't understand why it seemed more important that the women looked good. Um, I asked my mom, why this disparity existed. And she told me, well, unfortunately, in the world of TV, sometimes it's a lot easier for a woman to get a job based on her looks. And for whatever reason, that trend isn't as existent for men. And I remember thinking then, wow, I don't like that. I'm never going to go in a career where how I look will affect how well I do. And right there at, I don't know, eight years old, I felt limited in what I could do um, in, in society because I'm a girl. And I don't like that. But unfortunately, um, our genders do affect the way that we are viewed in society, and they do affect how well we do in our jobs. Women are still earning 70 cents to a man's dollar. Um, it, it'll take, at the rate that we're going, it will take 500 years for us to reach parity in Congress. Um, so obviously something has to be changed. The question is how? Uh, if we're talking about changing the way that society thinks as a whole. That, that's so insurmountable thinking, and this is something that we've been dealing with since men and women have existed. Obviously now we are as close as we've ever been to, to complete equality and the treatment of the sexes in society, but that doesn't mean that we're all the way there. And we need to be, because there's no reason that I or any girl or woman in this room should feel limited or less respected or less capable of what we can do because of our genders. But, um, <laughs> as I said, though, um, that's going to take some serious changing. And as I said, it's hard to know how to change it. We need to change the way that people think. But that's what a social activist does. Um, when, when we think of activism, there tends to be a stock image of hordes of people with picket signs standing outside of some government building demanding change for hours. That's, that's not necessarily all that an activist is. An activist changes things. We, we change the way that people think by changing little things in society. You know, no reform happens overnight. We change little aspects that influence the way that the world that we live in works. And we start from there, and over time, that builds, that builds up, and it changes the way that, the way that people think. Um, so I, I, as I said, have always sort of had an eye out for the unfair treatment of the sexes and um, I wasn't comfortable living in a society that I considered to be sexist, but I never thought of myself as a change maker. Um, I'm a teenager. I, I'm not a legislator. I'm not a congresswoman or a lobbyist. This shouldn't be my responsibility to change. Um, I shouldn't have to change this. How do I even go about changing this? I, I'm 17, but um, if everyone thinks like that, what is ever going to get done? Um, so I, I took my first steps towards trying to create change in society last, last summer, actually last late spring, um, when I found out through, through um, I'm in this small learning community at my school called the Civics and Government Institute, and it was brought to our attention that um, at this point, there hadn't been a female moderating one of the three presidential debates in 20 years. That's four elections, that's I think election longer than I'd been alive, and I was incredibly uncomfortable with this. I was wondering why, why, why haven't women been chosen? There's so many great female journalists who have been there, um, who would have been willing and capable of holding these roles just as well as a man can. Anyone who's seen the, the 2012 presidential debates, I think can agree with me that being a moderator is a hard job, but it's also essential. The moderator must be authoritative, they must stand their ground, they must have a presence strong enough to not be overshadowed by two people vying to be the one of the most powerful politicians in the world. It's, it's not, it's no small task, but that doesn't mean that a woman can't do it, 
And I think that we need to see women doing that. We can't just see that men are only doing it and that women are never even considered for the roles because what message does that send about what women can do compared to men? So I, I really was not comfortable with this, um, with this trend continuing. So to, uh, um, one of the teachers in the small learning community brought to, I have, I have two friends who are also very concerned about this, Sammy Siegel and Alanis and Barris, and one of our teachers brought this website called change.org to our attention. It's a platform where you can create a petition and um, if any of you have something that you want to change or demand to be different, I could not recommend change.org more. It is a fantastic platform. It has had thousands of victorious peti petitions on it. So my friends and I, we created a petition. It was really easy. We, um, we put in some of the emails of people on the Committee of Presidential Debates, and every time that someone signed it, there would be an email sent to them automatically with a text that we wrote asking them to choose a woman to moderate one of the presidential debates this year and um, saying why it was important to us. And we put it up on a Monday in late May, and by that Friday, over 100,000 people had signed it. Right. And <laughs> all that we had done, all that we had done was put the petition up there and um, send it to some of our friends, put it on our Facebook walls. But the reason that it spread so much was because the people who did see it, the people who saw it online, who browsed change.orgs for a way to make a difference, um, who received our links, they got so fired up about the issue, they, they were as passionate about changing it as we were, that they made sure that it got spread and that their voices were heard by our, our petition was tumbled, tweeted, Facebook shared, blogged about, emailed out. Um, it reached so many people and people took the time to sign it and to pass it on and that's what raised so much attention. Um, so we went down to DC and we delivered the petitions and we were turned away. And that's when the media started getting involved because the Commission of Presidential Debates didn't want to hear us. They, they refused to see us even though we'd been calling, trying to make a meeting with them. Um, so that, that's when the media started taking notice of what we were doing and we started being featured on programs such as Fox News, MSNBC News, the Melissa Harris Perry Show, NPR, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and it was unreal and this brought more attention to our cause and people were getting so angry and saying, this really isn't okay, why were these teenage girls treated like this and why hasn't there been a female moderator for 20 years? So um, that's when the Commission on Presidential Debates, I mean, they never said anything to us, but on August 15th, they announced the moderators and CNN's Candy Crowley, as I'm sure everyone in here knows by now, was chosen to do one. And I think that she did a phenomenal job. But um, Martha Raddatz also did one of the vice presidential debates, making it the first time in American history that of the four debates of election time, women have moderated half. So while that shouldn't be such a big deal because women are 50% of the population, <laughs> it was because they had been being overlooked, but they no longer um, were as of this year. So we don't know. Sammy, Elena, and I don't know how much of an impact we had on this, but we do know that it is too big of a coincidence for the first time in 20 years for the commission to suddenly choose two women to be up there, one moderating the presidential debates, for that to be the first year that people started taking notice. This is about people taking notice, people saying, I don't like this, um, you're some small bureaucratic group in Washington, D.C., but that doesn't mean that you can make all the decisions about what we see in our media. The debates served to inform the American people and um, the American people didn't like what was going on and so they had their input. No one had really been questioning it before. Um, and so that was really great. Even though it was a small thing, um, women, being, women being in the um, debates, it's, it's still another strong female role model that we had to look to. And it was a small step, but it was a step. So. Um, and I'd say that maybe we live in a little less of a sexist society today now that people have seen a woman, a strong female presence up there um, in a role of authority in American politics. So what I'm asking everyone in this audience to do is think of something that you would like to change and think of how you can do it. And I guarantee you that if it is a cause worth changing, your community will back you up and they will, they will help you. And that is how change is created. Thank you.